Okay, so welcome back everyone to the Explaining History podcast and I have the great pleasure today to chat with Mary McNeil and we are talking about her new book Centuries Witness which is the life and times of the exceptional US journalist Wallace Carroll. So firstly welcome Mary, thank you so much. Thank you, happy to be here. Thank you. Okay, so firstly before we get into talking about um, the book um, and the life of Wallace Carroll. There's a very interesting thing I observed in the kind of the introduction to the book. And you you talk really, um, it seems to be almost like a kind of like a lost world of, of journalism. Mm-hmm. Um, the one that we inhabit at the moment, whether you can mm-hmm. call it journalism, that's a, a moot point. Uh, one of kind of 24 hour news cycles mm-hmm. and kind of very um, sort of, extremely politicised and celebrityized sort of discourse. Very quickly, how did we get from one to the other? I mean, how are we, how are we here, do you think? Right. Well, I think back in the day when I was writing about Wallace Carroll, he, he basically lived from 1906 to 2002. And so he was writing for uh, much of that period. Um, but he he stopped working in journalism in 1973, mm-hmm. and during this time, um, a couple of things were at work. First of all, the written media was one of the main channels through which people got their information. Um, we did not have the multiplicity of channels, obviously, that we have now. You did have radio, but especially at the beginning of radio in the 1930s, uh, radio broadcasters got their copy from the written journalists, uh, for the most part. It, it mm-hmm. changed over time. So I think it's a combination of things. It's the multiplicity of media channels. It's the, if I can say this, uh, celebrity status of journalists. Wallace Carroll was, he abhorred uh, self-promotion, mm-hmm. whereas he was known. He He really tried to keep himself and his... He didn't try to be a celebrity, which I think is one reason he didn't go into TV uh, news reporting. And I think all of these things have changed and uh, contributed to this polarization we have now, where you are often seen as a journalist as representing one side or Mm -hmm. the other side. And uh, that's, you know, divided us uh, Mm -hmm. as a country and a civilization in a way that I think is really unfortunate. And the uh, the kind of the rules about due impartiality were obviously ripped up during the uh, the nineteen eighties. So that brought about the kind of the advent of partisan reporting right. uh, in the way you see with things like Fox News, for example, which is just one, but not the only uh, example of that. Yeah. Um, so so yeah, it, it, this this book's a kind of like a, a tribute to a, a type of journalist who probably still does exist somewhere in the world, but they are there are fewer fewer of them. It put me in mind of um, Robert Fisk, who was the, the great columnist, the great writer for the Times newspaper here in mm-hmm. Britain, mm-hmm. who covered the Middle East for sort of thirty or forty mm-hmm. years before he died. Mm-hmm. Um, so tell us about Wallace Carroll, um, for those who haven't heard of him. Right. He was, during his time, one of the most well-respected within the journalism field, but as I said, not popular in the sense of being famous as many journalists was were. He um, started his career working for United Press. Uh, and when he was, he was from Milwaukee, Wisconsin, uh, a rather poor family, but he did have a university education. And he was sent right away at the age of 22 to Europe. Uh, and in 1929, he arrived in the UK, mm-hmm. spent several years there, covered the hunger strikes um, that were going on, and then was sent to Paris, covered mm-hmm. some riots there, and then was sent to Geneva in 1934 to cover the League of Nations. So he really saw firsthand the discontent arising on the continent. Then he went as a diplomatic reporter and saw the rise of fascism very close up. And Mm -hmm. uh, uh, there's quite a bit about that in the book. And then he was made um, the bureau chief for United Press in London in 1939, Mm -hmm. just prior to the start of the war. Mm 
would he have been a contemporary of William Shira, who obviously yes. was the, the famous chronicler of the rise yes. of Nazis? Yes. One thing that is interesting about Wallace Carroll is he basically knew everybody. William Shire was among his best friends, used to dine together, get together quite often. And in fact, when Wallace Carroll wrote a book about yeah. Russia in 1942, uh, William Shire wrote him a glowing review in the Herald Tribune mm -hmm. uh, about the book. Uh, another journalist that you may know of, he was close friends with, was Ernie Pyle. Ernie Pyle oh, was yes. an American journalist, very well known uh, covering the war. He was actually killed in the Pacific during the war. Mm -hmm. So as I was writing this book, it was, I had a funny thought that he was almost like the Forrest Gump of journalism, not because of his uh, intellectual abilities, of course, but because he seemed to be everywhere and seemed to know everyone, yet he himself was not famous. I was reading um, a, an interesting article recently in a, a book on the, the history of Great Britain. They made the point that if you take prime ministers from uh, really fr from kind of Anthony Eden um, or well, Churchill all the way through to and senior cabinet mm -hmm. ministers all the way through to some of the senior cabinet ministers that were in Margaret Thatcher's government you had people that had mm -hmm. seen war had been in war had been at things like you know Edward Heath had come ashore at D-Day and whilst these people um, conducted, you know, quite a robust British foreign policy, they, their kind of ability to reflect on the seriousness of war um, were really shaped um, how, how they how they conducted the, you know, the, a lot of moderation in, in how far they push things. And I wonder if that's true of journalists as well. When you think about people who, you know, from Graham Greene onwards who saw war and all its goriness up, up front, whether that influenced a kind of, a, shall we say, a broadly liberal kind of world view? Yes, definitely. And I think it is true of journalists. I think journalists like Carol that covered the war and saw what it was like, they did not see journalism and journalists as enemies of the government. They actually saw them more as not propagandists for the government, but they had a deep responsibility not to report on things that were going to be dangerous to the population. Mm -hmm. And because they had lived through the war and lived through the bombings in London and lived through the hardships that, that were created, they came to journalism with a less antagonistic view than we have now of, yeah. of what reporters should do. They had a lot of responsibility inbred in them because of that. Yeah. And that's different today, I think, as well, because we don't face the same immediate dangers. And, you know, a, a whole generation has not lived through what what these folks lived through. Well, in, in terms of the, that boundary between um, government propaganda, which obviously all governments engage in, and the, the, the roles mm -hmm. and the rights of, of, of journalists, I mean, of course, you know, during the Second World War, the, the British and American governments both had their own, you know, official channels of propaganda. And they used journalists who were sympathetic towards that. And in fact, probably most correspondents had a sense of, of obviously being on a particular side. And there, there is a very fine line um, that, that I think correspondents walked between being part of the patriotic war effort or um, and informing the the viewers back home, the, the readers back home. I think Philip Knightley wrote a very famous book, The, the First Casualty, which um, talks about, you know, how embedded journalists wind up um, being, having very, as you put it, a very sympathetic relationship uh, with the, the army that they're with or or the government um, that they're, they're, they're governed by. W would you say that Wallace Carroll was, was kind of part of that? Yes. And when I first started to write the book, I, I was very curious about how someone could be a journalist with such high values in terms of journalism and then could also venture into the propaganda field, which he definitely <laughs> did during World War too. Yeah. He was in charge of European operations for the Office of War Information, mm -hmm. which was the U.S. propaganda arm. They had a domestic arm and an international arm. 
And I, I was curious about how he justified that. But I think he didn't see propaganda, and I have it in my in the book, as a not necessarily telling the truth. What they saw it as, as withholding some things that they didn't tell the public. Yeah. And he started off with that philosophy and tried to carry it through for quite a, quite a while while he was doing that. But yeah. as the war progressed, and you have to remember, he saw a lot of the war. He was in Russia when the Nazis invaded. He was in Pearl Harbor right after the Japanese bombed. He gradually came to understand that propaganda was really meant to support military efforts. Yeah. And if it was supporting military efforts, it was okay in the sense that the, the reason you were doing it was was right and needed to be done. Well, the, of, of course, I mean, the entire language uh, of uh, you know, terms like propaganda prior to the advent of Nazism, these are much more accepted terms. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The, the idea that in mass society, one shapes a narrative about whether it's foreign policy or domestic consumption or whatever, that uh, enables society to function in quite a, 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 a so, some kind of helpful way. Uh, normally, this is seen by the people that rule society, run society. Th this was not considered to be a particularly controversial idea. Um, and you obviously, you from the, the end of the First World War onwards, particularly in America, you see societies based around mass consumption, advertising, and this kind of Edward Bernays idea of shaping, the pu shaping public thought. Mm -hmm. um, so it's a... The, it's only really when you know the horrors of Nazism are revealed, and the the methods of you know Goebbels and things like that, mm -hmm. uh, which were really um, modelled on things that the British and the Americans had had perfected in in terms of shaping public thought uh, mm -hmm. previously. So then the propaganda really becomes a particularly um, questionable or um, mm -hmm. alarming term. Mm -hmm. And obviously, you know, the um, during the Cold War, it, again, it, the the idea that kind of governments can control thoughts, which you know, they're not actually yeah. quite as effective for that as we think. Um, so, so it's, it's easy to see how somebody, a, you know, a, a well-respected journalist would be of the view that you know you have to shape public discourse in certain mm -hmm. ways. Mm -hmm. And I think he did see it at the time as a way he could contribute more to the war effort than to just continue being a reporter at that point. And uh, I, I did, I do think he saw it as a public service uh, in a way uh, to joining the Office of War Information. In the U.S., there was something they had to overcome, though, because in World War One, there was a lot of propaganda that was against Germans, um, and. And it was, you know, it was sanctioned by the U.S. government and it resulted in a lot of, uh, you know, harassment of Germans in America. Mm -hmm. And so when the Office of War Information was created in World War II, they had to sort of walk a little bit of a fine line because there was an element of, of the population that really was hesitant about propaganda. And yeah. as you may know, Charles Lindbergh, when he was arguing against um, the U.S. entering the war uh, in support of uh, England said that basically we were being fed a bunch of propaganda by the government mm -hmm. about how we needed to enter the war. Mm -hmm. So um, it it was there, but the U.S. was not nearly as sophisticated in it in terms of international propaganda than no. I think the British were. I think the British understood better how you had to link propaganda to the war effort. And they yeah. were much more sophisticated in the sense of knowing how to do that than the Americans were at the start of World War II. And, yeah. and as well as Carroll was as well, and he admitted that. that yeah. He didn't know as much and he was on a learning curve about how to do that. And it was a very successful learning curve because um, America's kind of, uh, America's efforts, in almost every field, by the end of the Second World War, have eclipsed Great Britain. So they, they're, um, uh, there's a, a famous uh, scene from the Casablanca Conference where 
Winston Churchill um, persuaded Roosevelt, really for the last time, Winston Churchill got the better of Roosevelt and said, oh, we should invade the Mediterranean and North Africa and Italy, not go, uh, not do a cross-channel invasion, which was probably the right decision. Mm -hmm. um, and there were uh, people like George Marshall, um, I think probably um, various other senior American generals that said, well, you know, the British have been fighting for longer than this. They, they probably know what they know this stuff and the subsequent kind of um, setbacks and failings and shortcomings on the part of the British within six months the Americans were not thinking that any longer and they said you know we are we are the the, the lead now in terms of decision making and in terms of projecting the the narrative of the war by the the, the end of the second world war it's really American broadcasters, um, journalists, writers, and filmmakers that are are doing that globally. Um, yes, people like William Wyler, um, mm -hmm. director of the Big Country, um, and, right. um, and and various others. Yes, I think that that during the war, the war enabled in the US the sort of ramping up of this kind of activity. One, the, one of the directors of the uh, Office of War Information to which Carol had to report was a guy named Robert Sherwood. And Robert Sherwood was a speechwriter for uh, Roosevelt, but he also was a playwright and had won three Pulitzer Prizes. And he was very well known in the artistic theater world and literature world. And, and at the beginning of the war, all of these people, the William Wyler types, were brought in to, to, you know, that knew about movies and entertainment to sort of ramp up this effort. Mm -hmm. And I think you're right that at the end of the war, the, the U.S. had in some ways surpassed Great Britain in terms of their ability to put out these products. It was a huge effort, a huge effort within the United States, probably greater at, at the, in some ways than the efforts aimed at Europe. Sure, sure. Um, because you, you, the two branches that were doing this at the same time. Because you, you've yeah. got to keep this this um, domestic population in America committed to a war that nobody knows exactly when it's going to end. This is mm -hmm. the thing. Where, when we look back, we go, oh, 1945. Mm -hmm. Well, not everybody knew that or thought that. There was all right. sorts of thoughts. Well, this, this could go until 1947, 48. And mm -hmm. what we, we, we have to keep people buying war bombs, mm -hmm. accepting um, shortages of fuel and things like mm -hmm. that, and accepting possibly, um, you know, high, high losses now in places like the Pacific and, and Normandy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But when they were considering, well, what if we do have to invade the Japanese home isles, you know, you ain't seen nothing yet. Right, exactly. So having uh, people that can tell a coherent story um which is a in some ways when you're talking about nazism despite the the kind of the the many sort of moral ambiguities of uh britain and america um you know with racially segregated armies and mass civilian bombing the nazis are a very very useful bad guy to have because mm -hmm. Um, it, it helps to create this binary opposition of the mm -hmm. good guys and the bad guys, mm -hmm. um, which is always good when you're storytelling, I suppose. Yes, yeah, they definitely were were the bad guys, and it did it did make it easier in a way, and um, it, it made the whole conflict interesting in a way because we found out if we didn't know during the war, we found out after the war how bad they they really were, and. Mm -hmm. So it justified a lot of, of what was happening. One interesting thing uh, about Carol is that um, back then also journalists in some ways were seen as not spies, but they were asked by the government to report back on what they had seen when they went places. Mm -hmm. And when Carol went into Russia at the beginning, of, right after the Nazis invaded, he was among one of the first to get himself into Russia, which he was able to do because he had a lot of friends in the British government that basically got him in. He uh, spent, I don't know, about four and a half months there. 
and left right as the Nazis were at the gates of Moscow, mm-hmm. um, made this, occur- this crazy trip through Asia, you know, by all, all kinds of different means uh, to get home. And then uh, he had to report on what he saw. And one of the things that George Marshall had asked Wallace Carroll's boss to do was to, to find out some intelligence about how strong the Russian army was, because they didn't really know, because Stalin had kept such a, a tight control mm-hmm. over, over the army, and he had purged the army in the late 30s, and so it, it was hard to get in to find the information. So Carroll came back, and he wrote that he felt that Russia could beat the Nazis, and that uh, he, from what he observed, they were committed they were good partners that mm-hmm. we should be in this with, with the Nazis. And then subsequently, there have been some discussions where they name Wallace Carroll, where they sort of criticize him for not having seen how bad Stalin was. Sure. But it goes to the same, the same argument you just made is, well, here you are. Your objective is the Nazis, the, defeating the Nazis. They are the bad guy. So mm-hmm. he could hardly come back, even if he knew everything and report saying, oh, we shouldn't be in this with Russia because they're, you know, not a democracy in the way or they're, Hmm. you know. So all these things go to the main objective, which is to win, you know, to win the war, to beat the Nazis as as what your main goal is. And it's interesting in a sense, isn't it, how kind of improvised and threadbare um, at that point intelligence gathering is I mean we like when we think about intelligence gathering we work on this assumption that it's incredibly sophisticated mm-hmm. and well funded and well resourced and uh, you know obviously the in the twenty first century it, it it is but relying you know as the chief of general staff mm-hmm. uh, Roosevelt's top soldier relying on a, a journalist who's trying to get out of the Soviet Union. Mm -hmm. If there's anything you can tell me, please let me know. Mm -hmm. Um, It's the the informality of it I find Mm -hmm. find fascinating. Mm -hmm. Uh, But of course, uh, at that point, you know, America's kind of intelligence uh, establishment, intelligence system, intelligence um, establishment is is, is barely exists at all. Um, you, you, you have yeah, yeah. very, very little. So, um, so it, in, in some ways, one of the things I guess Wallace Carroll must have been a witness to is uh, America's kind of rise to very, very rapid wartime rise to kind of global, uh, global status. Yes, yeah, and he, um, you know, he had a long life. So after the war, he became very, um, uh, very, well, I don't know how much. He was not a spy, but he did know almost everybody that worked in that area. Uh, uh, Bill, Don- Bill Donovan, who mm-hmm. headed the CIA, and he also was very close with a guy named Frank Wisner, who basically was the chief spy and who worked in the U.S. government to help set up the CIA. Mm -hmm. And so he knew all these people very well. And I think he was as somewhat uh, somewhat unusual. He was very trusted by them because he was a very uh, intelligent, uh, rational man for being a journalist, not that journalists aren't intelligent and rational, but he had a real breadth of knowledge from being in Europe and just by the way his he was able to understand and articulate things so that after the war, and it was during the war that all these spy agencies were created, obviously, yeah. he also consulted and advised on some of the Cold War uh, things. In fact, um, in the Marshall Plan, uh, Avril Harriman, who had been asked to execute that by George Marshall, asked Wallace Carroll to be his deputy in Europe, mm-hmm. basically to help implement the Marshall Plan. But at that point, he he had been in Europe for 14 years. He wanted to come back to the United States, so he turned that down. Mm-hmm. Um, so in some ways, he was quite unusual in the depth of his knowledge of international affairs, uh, you know, security issues, Russia, mm-hmm. what policy should be in Russia. He was developed a very close relationship with Dean Acheson, 
who was the who constructed the post-war uh, policy arena under President Truman. Mm-hmm. And then, interestingly, he doesn't go on to become, um, you know, sort of a uh, editor of a national newspaper or mm-hmm. part of a a kind of, um, you know, what, what, what part of Ken, like Kennedy's Camelot or whatever. He doesn't become mm-hmm. that. Mm-hmm. Why? Why? Why does he adopt uh, uh, opt for such a more kind of humble? Um, this was one of the things that I that intrigued me about him is exactly that, because I think he really saw himself first and foremost as a journalist. Mm-hmm. And with that came a certain degree of independence. And he didn't shy away from if 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 he was being asked to do something he didn't feel was right, you know, quitting not. And he did when he ventured into the bureaucracy as a consultant, he worked on what was called the Psychological Strategy Board, which was a board that was set up in the late 1940s to talk about how the U.S. should present itself to in the Cold War. What are some of the messages that we should be sending out to Europe and others about democracy and so on and so forth? And he got very fed up with the bureaucracy yeah. because he wrote the paper and then it went back and forth. And then at the end of the day, Truman decided to not publish it. And I think he just saw himself not as somebody who could deal, who wanted to be in the bureaucracy because of mm-hmm. the independence he felt as a journalist and that that was his true calling. The, the, but the thing that is really, I think, amazing also and relates to his humility is he actually did go and work for the New York Times mm-hmm. and uh, and was the number two in their Washington bureau. So he he was covering Eisenhower and Kennedy, but then he decided to leave because they were trying to edit his work. They were trying to tell him what he could cover and couldn't cover. Mm -hmm. And he quit and he went to run this paper in North Carolina Mm -hmm. where the publisher gave him complete control over, you know, the paper. And he really felt that was what he should be doing. That was Mm -hmm. his calling and how he could best serve the community, even though it meant going from the national stage to a very small stage. And where, where was he, where did he situate himself within the, the civil rights struggle of the, because he would have been, you know, in that part of the world. Right. Right. He, he was right in the middle of it. He went to, to work at the Winston-Salem Journal uh, in 1964 as the editor and publisher. And soon after that, the Civil Rights Act came out and his stance was always Uh, We are supporting desegregation. We are supporting the implementation of the Civil Rights Act. But he didn't want to inflame. And there were several riots that happened in Winston-Salem, not too serious of riots in in the sense of scale or people getting Mm. hurt. And he would go and stay at the paper during those and make sure that the coverage was fair, supportive of, of, of desegregation, but conscious also of not inflaming in a dangerous way Hmm. too much the the argument and you know some people also could criticize that and say maybe he didn't come out enough but he saw himself as the objective publisher of the newspaper so therefore he he had to maintain a non-political um uh, appearance Mm-hmm. And that was very important to him. It's it's very easy retrospectively for us to demand greater levels of bravery from from those who are in very you know when you read about the the the, the violence in the south and the sort of bombings and assassinations and disappearances mm-hmm. and things like that. This is this is frightening stuff, mm-hmm. um, and you know. It's it's very easy retrospectively to say, well, yes, you know, should have you should have said this this thing that would have seen the paper fire bombed or or, or what have you. Well, right. people right. people don't, you know, <laughs> they don't. They, uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. they try to most of the time try to survive very difficult circumstances, but. Um, and is it the other thing? The I guess that the, as we like move forward in time towards the end of his career, it's really interesting. You mentioned 1973 is the year he retires. Mm-hmm. 
mm-hmm. which is, uh, you know, the, the year of Watergate. This right. Past, mm-hmm. What, I mean, did he say anything about Watergate, do you know, or? Uh, you know, there was a lecture that he gave at, when he retired, he, he was a professor uh, taught at Wake Forest University, which is also in Winston-Salem, which I happened to attend. And he did a whole lecture on Watergate. And I'm glad you asked the question because I listened to parts of that, but I didn't really get into his thoughts about that in a way that maybe I should have because I end the book in 1973. So I, I don't have too much um to comment on that. But I will say that knowing him and having read all his writings about journalism and what journalists should be and do, I feel he was totally in support of, uh, he may have liked Nixon beginning early on, possibly, Mm -hmm. but definitely by the time of Watergate, I feel confident he would have been calling for for the resignation and, and supporting. He was very good friends with Catherine Graham and Catherine Graham's son, Donald Graham, who ran the Washington Post. Mm -hmm. And Donald Graham actually is quoted in the book and is working with me to get the book out because Donald Graham thought he was the most wonderful journalist he ever met, which is pretty high compliment from, from the son of Catherine Graham and the owner, former owner of the Washington Post. Yes. 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 Well, it's um, wow. That, yeah, that's, the interesting that's... story there is that. Yeah, the interesting story is that uh, Catherine Graham's husband committed suicide, mm-hmm. and then she had to take over the role of publisher. You've probably yes. seen the movie, you know, uh, Meryl Streep as Catherine. Well, Graham. Greatly enjoyed it. Greatly enjoyed yeah. it. Yeah, and uh, at the time. Uh, Wallace Carroll was in North Carolina and he knew Don Graham, Donnie. So he invited Donald Graham to come right after the suicide down to Winston-Salem. He was 18 years old and he brought him into the newsroom and he sort of shepherded him around and helped him. And Donald Graham will never forget that because it was a really hard time for him. And Carroll you know, knew that and brought him out and got him out of that that situation. Wow. Yeah. Which I think tells you a little bit about, about his personality and his mentoring ability and how he liked to, he really wanted to help. It was that kind of a person. And it helps to sort of um, situate him just as, you know, his friendship with William Shire situates him at a particular place at a particular time. This helps us to kind of situate him as a historical figure in in that kind of moment. Mm-hmm. Um, and I, I think to kind of bring things to um, their, their logical kind of conclusion, we, we're now the spectacle, you know, we, we're now observers to this in- inquiry into the January the 6th I- I- insurrection. And you know what that, how that ends is is not for us to know right now. Mm-hmm. But the it, the thing that's being investigated is is of a magnitude several times greater than than Watergate. It's what they're investigating is unprecedented mm-hmm. in American history, really, at least since eighteen sixty five. But they would you say that that old world of journalism, the, the world of Wallace Carroll journalism, there are elements of that still when you look at the reportage of January of the January the 6th inquiry? Mm-hmm. I actually think yes. Um, if you look at the coverage by a couple, and it's unfortunately only a handful of newspapers, the Washington Post, the New York Times, the Los Angeles Times, I think the coverage has been Excellent. And in fact, the Washington Post recently won a Pulitzer Prize for its coverage of the January 6th insurrection. The change, which is an unfortunate change and and what we need to be worried about in our country, perhaps yours, is is the death of local newspapers and regional Mm -hmm. papers. That's certainly many towns now, like a town like yeah, a town like Winston-Salem which has about 350,000 residents, had this wonderful paper 
for mm-hmm. for many many years. Now it's it doesn't even have a paper. Basically, it's it's owned by a corporate chain that is all, cares about making money. It's full of advertisements, and this has happened all over the country. Sure. So the the argument now and the scare the scary thing now is that we we don't have that kind of coverage at the local level. Yeah. The business model has closed down these papers and ordinary citizens therefore are susceptible because they don't have local coverage to, you know, Fox News and mm. and what they hear on their social media because the newspapers that were trusted are no longer there. They were part of an ecosystem of, yes. of information, um, you know, often yes. imperfect, but part of that ecosystem nonetheless. Mm-hmm. That, uh, and you're right, the same mm-hmm. thing has happened in, in Great Britain. There are the, the kind of the um, local newspapers have been um, sort of merged and sort of um, grouped together into larger and larger and, mm-hmm. uh, and less and less locally rooted mm-hmm. newspapers. Um, or the print editions go and you have an online an online portal, which is largely clickbait. Right. Um, so it, it, it means that the ability of people to understand the, the functionings of the world around them, um, the workings of bureaucracy and business and all these kinds of things mm-hmm. diminishes. Um, and that's perhaps one part of the, the kind of trend towards conspiratorial thinking you know that the you know all this this sort of mad stuff that that um circulates on, on the internet um because all the frames of reference that, that, that people have for their lives are, are are dissolving and being replaced by this kind of easily repeatable stuff which yeah, right. I, I presume is a world wireless cow would not have recognized I think he would have been appalled. I, I think actually it's a good thing he passed away when he did, because when I think of some of the things that have evolved since he's been there in his time, the big the big demon was Joe McCarthy. If you remember who Joe McCarthy was, mm-hmm. even after all the communists, he was nothing <laughs> compared mm-hmm. to what we what we have today. And um, I think that that I think. It's really uh, something that I hope actually the book points out a little bit that, yes, let's think about what we used to have in the way of journalism and these vibrant local newspapers. And let's see if we can get back to that in a way so that people have a trusted source of information. And a source of information that's backed up, you know, this, the whole um, conspiracy, you, you mentioned conspiracy, I think it's very much rooted in the fact that people do not have trusted sources of information, and that makes them susceptible mm-hmm. to, to all of these crazy things that, that you hear and that you can get over social media and stuff. So yes. we're, we're ho- I, one of the uh, reviewers of the book is a, what, the media columnist for the Washington Post, her name is Margaret Sullivan, and she has written a lot about the death of local journalism. And we're mm-hmm. hoping that this model of Wallace Carroll going back to a local newspaper uh, kind of reminds us of what that can be again. And there are a lot, some efforts at nonprofits, you know, at the local level and trying to stimulate that again and sort of having journalists stay at that level and not wanting to be celebrities but wanting to serve the community a little bit more yeah i think that ethos is for many people it is it's still there yeah i think so i think there's a lot of hopeful signs actually that that it's it may be coming back i think in the from like 2005 to 2015 you had these big you still have it corporations buying newspapers for profit you know it's the profit motivation but really uh Carol and even the publisher he worked for in the Winston-Salem Journal, who was um, a very wealthy man, they saw it as this, the newspaper is a public service. Yes. Yeah. It wasn't there to make a lot of money. It was there as a public service. And if we, you know, if we could get back to that a little bit more, I think it would be helpful. Well, let's watch this space. 
Um, so thank you so much for joining me, Mary. It's been a delightful to chat and um, we would love to invite you back onto the podcast in the future if you happen to have the time. Um, now, be great. let's do a quick plug for the book. Um, is it okay. currently available in all good bookshops or is that? It, it's available um, online. It's at, it's online for, at Goodreads, I, I noticed. Um, okay. But the formal publication date is not until September 1st, but you can pre-order it now. We're going to be doing, you know, more things to get the word out over the next couple months. It's also on Amazon. It's on Barnes and Noble. So people can order it, um, but it won't actually arrive until September 1st. Okay, fabulous. And that is Centuries Witness, um, The Life of Wallace Carroll. Yes. Thanks so much. Thank and you very much. All the best. Right.